Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Rosenthal. I'm the Associate Director of the Bernstein Center for Leadership and Ethics at Columbia Business School. I'm excited to welcome you to our organizational leadership series featuring a conversation with Mr. Ken Wilcox, Emeritus Chairman of Silicon Valley Bank and Professor Todd Jick, Faculty Director of the Ruben Mark Initiative for Organizational Character and Leadership at CBS. Today's program is a featured event as part of our work with the Ruben Mark Initiative, which leverages the intellectual capital of Columbia business and law schools to teach the leadership skills necessary to create optimal organizational cultures. Mr. Ruben Mark, the former CEO of Colgate Palmolive for more than two and a half decades, was an innovator in the org culture space, and his methods are still widely implemented at the company today. We are grateful to have Ruben in the audience this afternoon. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. For the past 35 years, Ken Wilcox has been financing technology companies in the Silicon Valley and in other innovation centers around the world, formerly serving as CEO of SVB and before that as president of SPD Silicon Valley Bank, the bank's joint venture in Shanghai. Ken continues his deep professional ties with Asia through his current roles, such as chairman of the board of the Asia Society of Northern California, treasurer of the Asian Art Museum. Ken is also a published author, his recent book, Leading Through Culture, How Real Leaders Create Culture That Motivate People to Achieve Great Things, is the focus of today's exciting discussion. And our moderator, Professor Jick, who you, most of you already know and love from his popular CBS courses, including Bridge, Bridging the American Divide, Organizational Change, and Advanced Organizational Change, is one of the leading experts in the leadership and org change field and has been for more than 40 years. Before handing it over to Professor Jick, a quick reminder to send questions for Ken through the Q&A box, which will be monitored throughout the event. Thank you so much for joining us today. Take it away, Professor. Oh, Tracy, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Ken appreciates that. We're delighted, delighted, delighted to be here. Uh, and Ken, I'm very, very happy to welcome you to Columbia Business School and to be a part of this session. You know, the Ruben Mark Initiative is called the Ruben Mark Initiative for Organizational Character and Leadership. And if we were ever gonna have a speaker that was gonna to speak to these issues, it's the guy who wrote a book called Leading Through Culture, How Real Leaders Create Cultures That Motivate People to Achieve Great Things. So either you subscribe to the mission before, beforehand or instinctively you're synced up with the mission, but it's, it's just perfect having you here today. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Mm. I have read your book now twice, and that is, you know, for an author myself, it's an accomplishment when anybody reads your book twice. <laughs> but not only have I read it, but you see post-its all the way around it, which signals to our audience that there's a lot of good stuff here. There's a lot of good stuff for us to talk about. So you and I are going to take, you know, approximately the next half hour and kind of fireside chat some of the wonderful elements of your of your book, and then we'll we'll open it up. We'll open it up uh, for some for some uh, questions. The part. I guess the framing for your book and for our conversation and the way in which I experienced your book is as, as if we were in your head, as you learn to be a leader, as you discover what leadership is all about, as you learn the importance of culture, and as you pronounced its importance to all of us in the book, instead of sort of being sort of a know-it-all and sort of saying, why don't the rest of you get it? You actually showed us your journey. And that's what made it especially interesting to help people out can you just give a quick career pricey of how you got to where you got to, uh, a formerly CEO of, of Silicon Valley National Bank? Because I don't think it was an orthodox path. And then let's start digging into the book and some of the themes. Sure, I'll make this brief, but I will, <clears throat> I'll give you the major uh, points along the way. I grew up in a place called Flint, Michigan. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, when I was a kid, Flint, Michigan, allegedly had the highest per capita income in the US. Nobody was actually wealthy, um, but everybody was employed. I was there because my father taught organizational behavior at a place called General Motors Institute, which was preparing the future leadership uh, for the big three automakers at that point in time. Uh, when I was uh, uh, getting ready for college, I was focused on one thing and one thing only. I wanted to study overseas because um, I felt that uh, overseas um, studies really expanded one's frame of reference and helped an awful lot in terms of living a good life. So I uh, ended up going to Germany for a number of years. 
And in the in the course of all of that, I ended up with a PhD in Germanic studies, which is literature, history, and so on. When you do something like that, there's only one thing you can do with your life, and that is teach at a university. So I got a job at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and I uh, loved my job. I didn't love being poor. Uh, at that point in time, uh, professors got um, 2% raises, and the inflation rate was 12%. So you see, in five years, I had only half my buying power. So I... By the way, we're still doing the 2% raises, and we're aspiring... <laughs> 12% inflation rate. So we may, <laughs> we, we may get to you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Things haven't gotten much better. Huh? <laughs> In any case, I ended up going to business school. And when I got out of business school, I uh, was um, actually besieged with job offers in Boston. Um, especially in the commercial banking sector, which appealed to me because I knew nothing about business at that point in time anyway. And it seemed like a good place to go. With, by good fortune, one of my job offers was uh, into a so-called technology lending group, which was a brand new thing in that era. And I thought that'd be exciting. So I did that. And then in 1990, the Federal Reserve um, induced an artificial recession, in my opinion, in New England, uh, because they were very much worried about uh, real estate having had a bad experience in Texas. The result was the, my bank, the one I'd been with, uh, disintegrated for all practical purposes. And I got a hold of a brand new tiny startup bank in California called Silicon Valley Bank that was focused on lending to technology companies. Turned out on April 1st, my and my whole team uh, left the disintegrating bank of New England and became the first branch outside of Northern California for Silicon Valley Bank. And then Rest is history, high point being becoming CEO in 2001, CEO for 10 years. And at the end of that period, I was scheduled because we do succession planning to retire. And uh, uh, at that point in time, we got word from Beijing that Beijing wanted us to set up a bank uh, modeled on our own bank with the Chinese Communist Party as a 50% owner and we the other 50%. So we were off to Shanghai. And that lasted several years. Now we're back here in Silicon Valley. So uh, two things are apparent. One is that you're surrounded by books. So that's your, your academic heritage. I'm pleased, pleased to see that and appreciate that. <laughs> the second is that you ended up kind of growing into sort of banking and into leadership in a way that is very much expressed in your book. And I guess that's where I want to start because your book has sort of three parts to it. One is really becoming a leader and asking yourself questions about what, you know, what, what does it mean to be a leader? How, why should I be a leader? Why should people follow me? And the second is sort of what do you do in a leadership position? And the third is how do you sustain that and how do you implement change, sort of my, my particular area of interest, and do it cross-culturally because you say you've done a lot of work uh, across the world, but particularly in China. So let's start with that because, I, you know, it struck me, in fact, that's my first post-it here is your beginning of your book, part one, is, is the question, should you become a leader? Should you become a leader? And the reason I want to start with that is I think it raises questions about people's misconceptions about what leadership is, because you, you, you grew to answer, answer that question or even ask yourself aspects of that question that were quite different. So tell us a little bit about how it started, because one more thing for everybody listening. Your book is not for CEOs alone. The whole book is written for leaders at all levels. And so this question right. of should you become a leader is a question that really all our students want to be asking themselves as they think about the beginnings of their careers. So tell us a little bit more about why you asked that question and how you answered that question. Well, I'm, I, I'm very happy that you pointed that out because uh, I really and truly wrote this book, not with CEOs in particular in mind. I wrote it for anybody who's going to be in a leadership position. And of course, probably everybody in the audience today is either now in a position of leadership or will be in the not too distant future. You're all pegged for leadership positions. Um, I will also admit that I was heavily influenced as a child anyway by my father because when he taught organizational behavior for General Motors, uh, he had a very negative opinion actually of General Motors as a corporation. He thought that it was, um, to use his terminology, toxic, that you couldn't have a fulfilling life as a employee at any level at General Motors. He, uh, but he was very much against what I, I think at the time they called theory X management, 
which is top down. And so he would lecture us in the evening at the dinner table. First, we all thought he was goofy, but in time, uh, we learned to appreciate it. So I always had that in the back of my mind, that a corporation could be a place where people self-actualized, to use his Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs terminology. Yes, yes. And I never really was aiming at being in charge. I just wasn't. Um, I enjoyed uh, my work and I enjoyed being a team leader, uh, but that wasn't a very high leadership position. And then in uh, 2000, at the end of 2000, the, my predecessor decided to retire. The board came to me and said, we would like you to take this position. Uh, and I will tell you what my immediate emotional response was for about, um, five minutes, I was elated, like I won the lottery. And who wouldn't feel that way, at least for the first five minutes. And then after five minutes, I realized I, I wasn't at all prepared for this. Uh, I don't know how to be a CEO. And uh, how am I going to do it? So I looked around and I, uh, dredged my memory bank and quickly came to the realization that, in my opinion, I didn't have any positive role models. I had never worked in an organization where I thought the CEO was actually doing a very good job. So I was scared to death. I went from elation to being scared to death. And, but you know, it is what it is. And I put on my blinders and the next morning I hired a consultant to help me. I started reading books on leadership. I started making appointments with people that were known to be good CEOs in Silicon Valley and forged on ahead. And I will tell you, add one thing to it that, and that is I became CEO literally in the same month that in retrospect, the Federal Reserve determined the recession, uh, the long recession of the first decade of this millennium uh, was just getting started. So I had one big advantage uh, that I, I wanna mention, and that is everybody, um, was disappointed in everything I did for the first three months, or three years, rather. Every board meeting was, the numbers were worse than the one prior. The uh, board was always anxious. Wall Street was mean-spirited and highly critical. The employees were very uh, nervous. But the advantage to that is, if you know that no matter what you do, it's going to be wrong, or perceived as wrong by others, you can pretty much do what you think is right. And that was my big advantage. I was able to, for several years, focus on exactly what I thought made sense. Well, I, I, I want to pick up on those themes, but just just a quick uh, technical matter. I'm hearing as you as your hand is hitting the the, the desk. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll be more careful. Hand, so I just want to kind of uh, uh, okay. love to see the gesticulation, but we're hearing it. So just, just <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think your uh, perhaps describing what your experience was, maybe understating it, because in the book, you said, first of all, a friend of yours said when you were chosen, you were the least likely to have been chosen. And then you say in the book, I was, I was lost. And to be completely honest, I was lost, at least at first. And I, again, uh, you, you go on to say that a lot of people instinctively taking on leadership think, oh, great, I'm in charge. I'm ready to tell them what to do. And you quickly sort of disabused yourself of that. I mean, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, what, what was the sort of journey to humility and to discovery in that early point? Because again, I think a lot of people can relate to that. They're going to be excited to have impact. They're going to be excited when they get a leadership appointment of any kind. And you're sort of saying, hold on a second. Should you really be a leader? Ask yourself these questions. Can you say a little bit more about, about that, that you, in those difficult three years, and even though you know you could kind of do no wrong because everything was going wrong, uh, what were you asking yourself that were sort of revelatory? Yeah, well, first of all, I really believe that if you uh, look, look at history or for that matter, look at the business press today, that the least effective and the least impressive leaders <clears throat> are those who appear to be in it primarily for self-aggrandizement. They want to be powerful. They want to be in charge or they want to become wealthy. Um, and that's where it stops. Whereas the most, most impressive, impressive leaders, both historically and in today's world for that matter, are people who are trying to accomplish something that will benefit um, others, benefit their own employee base, uh, benefit the world at large. And I think that um, 
So somehow, somehow it's not about you. What I understand from the book, it's not about you. Right. It's about thinking outside of you and what you can do for others. For right. Organization like, but that, you know, again, was some almost counter to the instinct of my ego should drive it. It wasn't your ego that was driving it. No, it wasn't my ego that was driving. Of course, I have an ego like everybody else. And when you uh, do something and it ends up being a good job, you can feel good about it. Um, there's no doubt about it. But I guess I just felt, and I truly think that the best leaders feel this way, that their mission is to do something that helps other people. And that's why I, one of my claims in my book is that one of the hallmarks of leadership is having a vision. Meaning, in my opinion, especially leaders that are at the top of the pyramid. In my opinion, leaders at the top of the pyramid, and we can look at history, we can look at today, are people that are focused on the future. Typically, they delegate um, execution in the present to people that report to them and focus on the future. They have a vision, and their vision involves taking their organization to a better place where people that report to them are better off and maybe the environment in which we operate is better off. And they can articulate that vision. That's what's most important, that they can and do articulate that vision often and in a way that results in their followers being able to, in their mind's eye and vision, what it will be like when the leader's vision comes to fruition. Yeah, and, and in fact, you also ask yourself, I'm looking down at the book now, are you, are you, do you want, um, uh, are, you, are you prepared to deal with the fact that as a leader, people will be copying your behavior all day long? So in addition to you articulating a vision, you're sort of a role model. And you know, I think that's the, the second. You, you have weaknesses as well as strengths. And the other thing you said is be, at, be honest with yourself about your weaknesses because they're looking at you, including your weaknesses. Again, right. that kind of usual pronouncement of leadership books is not, be sure that you, you're clear about your own weaknesses is more sort of just, you know, advertising your strengths. That's not the way you, you, you presented it. No, I think that the best leaders, um, that sounds <laughs> a little self-serving because I'm, I'm obviously considering myself to be in that category, I guess, but I think the best leaders historically and today are people who know themselves. They know what their weaknesses are. They know what their strengths are. And they try not to um, accentuate their weaknesses because the truth is all great, le all leaders, not just great leaders, all leaders are copying, are being copied by the people that report to them. And that's in, in any context and at any level. If you're a team leader in any kind of an organization, by way of example, with you know a handful of people reporting to you, I will guarantee you that they're copying you, whether they realize it or not. Uh, if and it's very obvious in simple ways, if you come in early, they come in early. If you come in late, they come in late. If you're mean to other people, they'll feel they have license to be mean to other people. If you're kind to other people, they feel the obligation to be kind to other people. So you, a leader not only has to have a vision um, or is a person by definition with a vision, but it's also a person who is aware of the burden of responsibility that involves being in a position where you're automatically being copied. And that's not something you can turn off. No, no, it isn't. It isn't. But you're also trying to mitigate that a little bit by the kind of people you surround yourself with, because right. people copying you, if they're imitating you and they're like you, you're just going to get your likeness expanded. And maybe that's got some benefits, but mostly it's not going to give you diversity of views. It's not going to give you. So you also, you go on to talk a lot about hiring people. Yeah. Again, even you gave an example of where you made a mistake. Hiring. And again, your book is filled with self-acknowledgement that, you know, I didn't do this perfectly and I learned, but I learned from each of my mistakes. So tell us a little bit about that. So it, as you first start by looking in the mirror and say, you know, what does it mean to be a leader and how do I assume the responsibility of this and how do I exude that sort of otherness? You then said, now I've got to assemble a team around me and then we'll get to build the culture. Those are the next two ingredients I want to touch on. So let's talk about hiring people and building a team. Because again, I think you had some interesting insights about that. Well, it's a very difficult process for one thing. And I made a number of mistakes along the way. I think largely through um, on the one hand an experience and then on the other hand, feeling under pressure to move quickly, uh, which was self-imposed. The truth is I didn't have to find um, the team as quickly as I felt that I did. It's very difficult to hire also because 
unless you're an experienced interviewer, you tend to lead the witness, meaning you, you ask questions that subconsciously are designed to get the person to say things that lead you to believe that you found the right person. It's almost like dating. You know, you go out on a date and you say, I love red. What do you think? They say, I love red too. And pretty soon you're thinking, oh, we should get married. We're so much alike. Yeah. That's a big mistake. Um, so I learned one thing I learned was how to interview in a way that people couldn't tell what direction I was, my questions were taking them or what answers I might be looking for. That gave me a more honest picture. But there's also the question of what are you looking for when you hire? And I want to run through a couple of things here that I think are really important in that regard. On the one hand, you want people with a value system similar to your own, at least in terms of um, significant aspects of your value system. Uh, at the same time, though, you don't want carbon copies of yourself because part of the reason, part of the reason that you have a team is to expand your ability to make the best decisions. That means it's good if they have different experiences from your experiences and if they have different skills from your skills. So the, the commonality that you see would be values, but you expect to have diversity in terms of experience and in terms of knowledge base and in terms of skill set. And um, you also should be looking, in my opinion, for emotional EQ. Because one of the most difficult, uh, one of the things that renders teams often not as effective as they could be otherwise is having too many people that don't act like adults and don't know how to work with other people who have different opinions and have a different way of looking at the world. Whereas in, in the ideal set of circumstances, you value people that have a different way of looking at the world and that have. A, a different different skill sets and different frames of reference because so cut to the chase here real leaders decide on big things themselves but with the help of their team so a real leader may say look we've got this decision to make we've got we have this challenge come together with me and let's discuss it i'm acknowledging that because it's a big one I'm going to make the decision myself in the end because uh, I have responsibility. That's my job as the leader. But I can't do make a good decision without the benefit of your experience, your IQ, your point of view. And I really want to discuss this with you. And I want you to tell me what you think. And I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I recall a phrase in the book, Ken, where you talked about, I want to have people around me who compliment me, not compliment me. That was compliment with an E to begin with, or complimentary to me, as opposed to paying me homage all the time. And That's you also right. said, I want people, especially with EQ, I mean, they can have IQ, but you really want EQ. And then you, you, you went even further, and I really appreciated this. I don't want people who are either passive aggressive or obnoxiously assertive. I mean, you really were very clear about, I want people who are also going to be able to work well together with their differences, with their complementarity because of a certain kind of style that they have. So this, this formation of the team is no small effort, I guess, is the, is the punchline of this. And uh, what, what happens if you inherit people who aren't, who aren't suited to- I think if you inherit people who aren't suited, well, if you inherit anybody suited or not suited, within a very short period of time, they're your responsibility. You can't go through the next five years saying, you know, I really didn't want that person, but I inherited them because it's it's your responsibility. So you give them, you assess them, and as quickly as you reasonably can, fairly, and to the extent that they don't correspond to the things that I just said, I think you try to coach them to the middle. But you don't spend all year coaching either. If you can't get them to the point you need them to be in order to be good contributors, you you invite them to work someplace else because they'll be happier. You'll be happier. Everybody will be happier. I mean, you know what, what I, I guess I want to underscore for, for our audience is that, you know, you were a CEO of a, of a financial services firm, obviously giving out uh, loans, tech companies and the like. Uh, it's not the obvious place for someone spending a lot of time working on these soft, the soft stuff, 
So you're, you're saying, first of all, I looked in the mirror. I really thought about myself as a leader. And I said, it's not about taking charge. It's not about ego. It's about what am I going to do for this larger uh, organizational effort? How do I then assemble a group of people that are going to be empowered and entrusted to do a lot of that for me and with me? So it's not, again, just about me. So again, working on forming this team, creating, creating the right mix of people. And then comes now the Ruben Mark Initiative organizational character. We got to talk about culture because then you yeah. write a whole section about culture. And again, you know, culture, the soft stuff, you're a CEO, you got to, you know, deal with shareholders. What, why are you bothering all this? Tell us why that caught your attention, why the culture issue became so important, what you meant by it, what are the key ingredients of it? Take us a little bit into that territory. And then we're going to go to, there's some questions later about the cross-cultural issue, but stick for the moment about corporate culture. Right. Well, first of all, the bridge to the question of culture is this, and that is that the best leaders focus primarily on very few high-level strategic decisions and on building the culture and everything else they delegate down so that they're delegating leading the corporation on a day-to-day -day basis, executing the strategy to other people. Given that, there have to be rules for how people behave. Culture, every organization has a culture, whether they know it or not. And a culture is nothing more than a set of either written or unwritten, usually unwritten, rules, norms for how we treat each other and how we treat people outside the corporation. And because that plays such a major role in the life of a corporation, it is, in my opinion, the deciding factor on whether or not that corporation is going to be successful. Strategy is important for sure, but strategy is a roadmap. It's, an it's the result of an intellectual activity. And you can actually hire people to build your strategy for you if you're so inclined. You can't build people or hire people to build your culture for you because that's something that emanates from the leadership itself. Uh, and culture is what drives the organization. Strategy speaks to the mind, the culture speaks to the heart, and it's the heart that drives people. It truly is the heart to, uh, that drives people. So the culture then is how do you want people to behave and how do you want them to work together? One of the biggest d d d um, ways to distinguish, in my experience, better cultures from less good cultures is are they vertical or are they horizontal? Meaning the vertical cultures, which in my experience, they, you encounter them more frequently than you do the horizontal cultures. The vertical cultures are cultures in which people spend um, excessive amounts of time kissing up and um, uh, excessive amounts of time pushing down. Whereas horizontal cultures are clearly the opposite. People devote the majority of their psychic energy to building good relationships with their coworkers on their teams because those are corporations, those are companies that are trying to make their, their, their clients happy. And in today's world, clients have sophisticated problems to solve. They need sophisticated products. And those can't be created or delivered by a single individual. So an individual, they require teams. So the successful corporations encourage people to have a horizontal orientation and to build strong teams that can make clients happy. And you as a leader, and again, as a CEO, you have, a, you have the ultimate responsibility or certainly sort of play, play an active role in the creation of that culture and the sustaining of the culture. People at other levels of the organization, however, also in leadership positions represent the culture or can extend the culture in the way in which they're doing it. But now we got to go to one of the dirty little secrets, Ken. It's got to come out because it was in your book, you acknowledged it, which is you did go to that other business school. I believe it's up, up river called Harvard Business. School, <laughs> and you said at Harvard Business School, we culminated our second year MBA program with a course on strategy. The emphasis was right. really get that strategy thing down. And what you say in the book is that's not the way it ended up uh, in, in, in your experience, that wasn't the sort of fulcrum point, the culmination. The actual, you know, you went to that, you know, culture eat strategy for breakfast phrase, but basically what you were saying is uh, a good strategy will get you just so far without having the culture. And so in a way, you know, the kinds of things that I teach and we teach and that Ruben Mark himself personally stood for at Colgate are all about the importance of this culture factor. Obviously getting the business model right and the strategy is critical, but I want to just reinforce that you acknowledge that in a way 
our MBA education would really benefit us if we focus on things like the, the corporate character and, 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 and culture. That's absolutely the case. You know, I'm the last person in my section to say that the, my experience at HBS wasn't a good one. It was a good one uh, because it helped me get a job. <laughs> but the truth is, when I got out there into the corporate environment, the only things that I had learned that were of any real benefit to me were the so-called so soft skills. The organizational behavior course was wonderful for me the leadership course was wonderful for me even the um uh public speaking course which sadly wasn't taught by anybody who did a very good job that was crucial the soft skills are what makes the difference and the truth is the hard skills you can hire for easily and they're out there um, you, of course, you got to be very careful who you hire because you br could bring uh, in somebody with a, an important hard skill, but so little in the way of soft skills that they would screw it up for you. But it's it's the soft skills that, that truly make the difference, and that's not just uh, that's not just one of my beliefs. This is something that you can easily prove by analyzing corporations that you read about in the Wall Street Journal every day. Think about the ones that have screwed up. Uh, these people often have hard skills but they almost always have poor soft skills the yeah, ones that end up screwing up and and, and it, it appears it emerges in everyday uh behaviors I, I again i i commend people to look at your book i think there's a lot of good uh, uh material in it but particularly at the level of sort of what you did every day or what you tried to do so i'm going to just mention a couple of these things and then i want to uh, turn to a couple of last topics and turn to student questions the the um one of the things I read in here is you said, um, try as often as possible to have a conversation without an agenda. Skip the agenda. Very, very good advice about you know opening yourself up to listening to other people and getting into the in, into what's on their mind. Um, assume innocence on their part. Don't demonize other people you know who might be coming with a different point of view. Uh, solicit opinions. Demonstrate respect. And then you've got a whole section here. A note on remembering names. Uh, well, what what was that all about? What was that all about? remembering names yeah I, I, I had one one major advantage and that is when i was ceo there were only about 1500 people and uh today there are thousands and thousands so it's a little tougher but i made a special point of knowing everybody's name it, it, you know the truth is people are individuals they're they're every one of your employees is an individual and they want to be spoken to as an individual. They want to feel important. They want to feel that they're making a contribution. They want to feel that their leadership cares about them. And, and, and that's what drives them. And so I, I uh, in my quote unquote wisdom, insisted on a, an early version of Facebook, so to speak, <laughs> that we created ourselves. And I was 50, I spent 50% of my time in planes because I visited every office for usually three, four, five days every year. And we had, you know, tons of offices around the country and in other parts of the world. And the plane on the way, I would um, re-memorize the names uh, using the Facebook. <laughs> and it worked brilliantly uh, for several years. And then one day I remember in Denver where we had an exceptionally large office I got 59 names right and one wrong. And I realized at that point, I better quit hot dogging because that person felt so devastated. <laughs> uh, I, I feel your pain on that. I feel your pain <laughs> on that. I work hard to remember names too, and I make a mistake and it, and it kills me. It's yeah. A, we, I, I wanted to say we, we and those employees, I'm sure appreciated the effort, the sort of personalization. I mean, that's then that, you know, again, that's sort of the, the soft touch. I, I want to go to a couple of these questions in the in the interest of time uh, uh, that I want I want to cover and then ask you maybe as a finale to say something about leading change, which is certainly implementing mm -hmm. change. A number of my students are on this or will be listening to this. Uh, Elena Mayer asked an interesting question about the cross cultural issues. So you end your book and you've actually written a whole new book now that's coming out about relations with China, and you went and lived over in Shanghai. And you, you know, the company has been dealing with, with China and a variety of things. And the question is, can you talk about cross-cultural change management when you're working with employees in the US and employees in China or somewhere else, and you need to bring groups of employees from different cultures along to the, to the same and change over the same timeline? What do you recommend keeping in mind? You know, to give us some insights about cross-cultural work and maybe particularly with your, your experience in China. Yeah. 
Uh, let me give you two extremes. One is when we, my, when I joined Silicon Valley Bank, I started that office in Boston, and then we had California where the other offices were. Even here, we had cross-cultural issues. Within because, the US, across the U.S. Yeah, across the U.S. And there are two ways that, that people deal with cross-cultural issues. Sadly, neither of them work. One of them is to write off the other people as stupid, and the other one is to write off the other people as evil. And that is not a formula for success. <laughs> you don't get people working together cooperatively to achieve great things by telling them they're either stupid or acting like they're evil. So, uh, and that's a lesson for life. That's even when you're talking about an organization of two. So uh, I would say that uh, China's at the other end of the spectrum. I've been in m many, if not most places in the world. And uh, China is for me the most different in terms of its political system and in terms of its, its culture itself. So when you get to China, um, you, you, you're, you're faced almost immediately with um, seemingly um, uncrossable chasms. These people are so different and their government is so different. And people fall victim, obviously, to the temptation to write it off. It's, it, the, the people are either not that smart or they're, uh, they're, they're out and out evil. And if you come to the conclusion that that's true, you probably shouldn't have gone in the first place. Uh, but you have to deal with people as they are for the most part. And you have to spend your time understanding, learning, trying to develop a theory that assumes innocence. If in the end, after extensive periods of time, you conclude that, you you're back at square one that they're that the people that you're dealing with are either incompetent or or not honest then all bets are off I, I think you have to change your course of action and retreat but that's not a formula for for winning or succeeding or accomplishing anything great so that's i think the the big lesson in in cross-cultural is you have to keep peeling back the onion until you figure out what the core is well, that, I mean, and that to me, you know, you ended the book with the, the chapter again about your work in Shanghai. And what struck me at the end is you didn't end up with sort of a pat set of recommendations of, you know, just do this and do that and it's all going to be fine. You actually said it is a, it, it's, it's a journey of learning, uh, of respecting and, and discovering the fact that there are real differences and these differences need to be understood and then in some way reconciled. But you, 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 you again were very humble in the way in which you looked at other cultures as opposed to somehow judgmental uh, or much less calling them you know, evil or, or, or and the like. So I, I, that, it struck me that's very consistent with the way in which your overall approach was uh, as, a, as a leader. Uh, Ken, let me ask you a question from a colleague. Dave Rogers, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very uh, presumptive here to ask your question. This is a colleague who does a lot of work in terms of digital transformation of, of companies. He says, if culture is defined as behavior, how can leaders leverage formal processes metrics, resources, incentives, et cetera, to re reinforce and support a culture change and ensure that legacy processes do not stymie and undercut the culture you're setting to uh, foster, seeking to foster. And with that, you're in your book, you talked about cops and robbers, subcultures that were sort of at odds with each other. So Dave, I'll supplement your question because there also was kind of a battle of subcultures that you confronted in the bank. So say a little bit about how do you reinforce all this? It's one thing to message it, to have a vision, to model it. Dave's asking the question, what about all the other tools at your, at your disposal? Well, first of all, if I understand the question correctly, it's how can you use technology in part to help reinforce your culture? And clearly technology, among other things, can do many, many things, and particularly now that we're in the AI world. But um, in general, culture is a good way of accumulating and analyzing data. And data is a reflection of behavior. So it gives you the, um, the opportunity to actually do an even better job of disseminating culture than you might otherwise and of evaluating people and it's the evaluation part that i think is really important one of the things we did at silicon valley bank when i was a, pre a ceo which i think they still do today but i'm not 100 certain i'm banging the table again is the uh 
is we graded people um, in two different ways. Number one is your your evaluation and is not based on your boss's opinion alone by any stretch. We did what we call unit evaluations, and that means that everybody is evaluated by representatives from adjacent teams that with which your team needs to cooperate. So it's a lot of input, not just a single person's input. And that uh, technology can be used there too to accumulate data and and um, apply it. But the other thing is, only fifty percent of your bonus is based on your so-called production in quotation marks. The other fifty percent is based on your um, adherence to the culture. And one of the uh, cornerstones of our culture is it's that you you are expected and required to act in a way that helps your coworkers succeed and helps your clients succeed. It doesn't make any difference how many widgets you sell, how many accounts you close, if your coworkers aren't benefited in their activities by your activities, you haven't done a good thing. And if your clients aren't happy, you haven't done a good thing. So but that's sort of the, the, the reinforcement or the, the, the vindication for, for this behavior. Right. I, I mean, I think Dave also said, you know, metrics, that's the performance evaluation incentives. So many ways in which you can you can reinforce it. We're coming to near the end. So I just want to ask you maybe a, a couple of closing questions before I, 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 I pronounce a little bit about your change management advice, which was very good. Again, our audience has a number of, of our younger uh, MBA students uh, who are really you know, seeking advice, career and life advice. I mean, again, you were an MBA student yourself, you went on to have a very successful career. But if you think about what advice you would give to folks early in their career around leadership, around sort of just thinking about their career trajectory that you wish you knew or now you know that you want to share. Yeah, I would I would say four things. Um, one of them is to try to know yourself, know your strengths and weaknesses, know your inner demons so that you can control them. And also know what your basic skill sets are. Some people are better at selling things. Some people are better at analyzing things. Um, if you're better at analyzing, don't be, try to be a salesman. And, and, and so it goes. There are probably only 10 or 12 basic skill sets in, that are inherent to human nature. So know where you fit in that. Second thing is, well, if you're, if you're interviewing for a job, do your best to find out what the culture of the organization uh, for which you're interviewing is all about because whether or not the culture fits you, there's no culture that fits everybody. Even our culture at Silicon Valley Bank doesn't fit everybody, but if you don't fit the culture and the culture doesn't fit you, it's not gonna be a happy marriage. So it's really, really important. Number three would be uh, don't underestimate the soft stuff. The, even the phrase soft stuff makes it sound like it's not really worth knowing. <laughs> Uh, first of all, the soft stuff isn't so, so soft, it's hard. And, uh, and secondly, it's what makes the difference. It really does. It, sometimes when you use the term soft stuff, when people use the term soft stuff, they assume that means being Mr. Nice Guy to everybody. And the soft stuff's not about being a nice guy. The, the soft stuff is about understanding that you're dealing with humans. And that's and treating them like humans. And then finally, for your first job, people that aspire to leadership positions, um, question why you aspire to them and, and make sure that your motivations are, are good ones, that it's not all about self-aggrandizement, that it's about doing something good because that's what will determine whether or not you actually in the end get promoted, I think. When people are looking, when boards or management teams are looking to replace somebody and bring in a new leader at any level, they they should not focus exclusively on the skill set. They should focus on the emotional IQ because leaders need emotional IQ more than they need skill sets, uh, uh, at least subject matter oriented skill sets. So Ken, I think that's those all those four points are extremely extremely helpful bits of advice for our for our, our many many of uh, in our audience and i think that you know it's something that they should take take to heart and you're again somewhat counterintuitive to both the advice you were given at b school but also the 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 kind of classic advice of a ceo which is you know kind of do the job well and and, and know the hard stuff you're you're recognizing that the soft stuff is the hard stuff and in fact will give you the biggest payoff i guess as a final note 
I won't do much because we're, we're at the end here, but you did have a whole chapter on implementing change, which I appreciated. And your principles were extremely helpful about involving others from the start, which I certainly preach, uh, anticipating and preparing for resistance and knowing kind of how to, how to read that. But you had a very interesting point also about protecting the change agents, that you also want to see people succeed who are trying to drive a change agenda. Just do a 30 second, just give a word about protecting the change agents. I think that's a very, very helpful point about how to sustain what you're trying to your, your whole agenda. No, there are two aspects of that. One of them is that if you were to say, we're going to create a new thing in our corporation, and I want input from each of the various um, subject matter experts, every one of them will find some reason why it won't work or why it's too risky. So you're going to get a whole bunch of naysayers um, and come emanating from every one of the subject matters. Um, that's number one. And number two is, <clears throat> And it's a little bit the prodigal son story in a way. You, you get this group that's going off and they're building something new that's revolutionary and everybody's supposed to be proud of it. And yet everybody else feels jealous. Everybody else is vested in the status quo. And they want the status quo to continue because that's where they get their respect. And if you, so the, the people will subconsciously attempt to undermine the new project, kill it so to speak, before it, 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 it emerges from the womb. And then the other thing that will happen is uh, if you can't figure out a way of making it appear to be everybody's success and to everybody's benefit, there'll be jealousies emanating from the 90% that weren't involved that are wedded to the status quo. And they'll feel, they'll feel like uh, the, the, the ignored sibling. Yeah. Well, I will tell you this, Ken, your enthusiasm for this subject matter is obvious. And we're a few minutes over now in part because that's my normal course of doing things, but you contributed to it as well because there's so much to talk about. We didn't get to all my post-it notes in this, but I commend, commend your book to people if they wanna read the Leading Through Culture book by Ken Wilcox and a, a new book that will be coming out about uh, cross-cultural uh, uh, work in China. Uh, I think we, we appreciate the fact that you're bringing us sort of the insights of a career, but insights that are useful at the beginning of career, as well as as you ascend in your, in your career. And I, I appreciate the fact that you have brought light to areas that I believe strongly in as well, and you, you role model it. The book itself is filled with humility, is filled with discovery, and gives us all, I think, hope that we can do this uh, and grow into leadership. So for that, we want to thank you for the time today. Thank you for the contribution of the book and wish you a lot of success going forward. And thank you for the opportunity. I very much appreciate it. All right, Ken. Thanks to everybody, particularly on a sunny day in New York for being a part of this uh, webcast. And thanks to Ruben Mark and the Ruben Mark Initiative. All the best.